Good morning, everyone. I'm Beth Minio, Director of the Center for Disability Studies, and I want to welcome you, those of you in attendance here at the beautiful Roselle Center for the Arts at the University of Delaware, and those of you who are tuning in via live stream to our Civil Liberties Forum, Underrepresented No More, People with Disabilities in Elections. They constitute one in five people within the population, but people with disabilities fail to exercise the clout those numbers suggest because too few of them vote. It's a paradox. Surveys show greater percentages of American adults with disabilities engage in the political process than their counterparts without disabilities, yet smaller percentages of those same adults with disabilities actually vote in elections. We've convened this exemplary panel of experts and advocates to explore what can be done to get more people with disabilities to cast ballots and by voting have a greater impact on the formation of policy in the months between elections. It is my sincere pleasure to introduce our panelists. To your left, Dr. Rabia Belt, legal historian and assistant professor at Stanford Law School. Virginia Atkinson, Inclusion Advisor at the International Foundation for Electoral Systems. Michelle Bishop, Voting Rights Specialist with the National Disability Rights Network. Helena Berger, President and CEO of the Ameri American Association of People with Disabilities. And Matt Den, Attorney General for the State of Delaware. In addition to my asking questions of our panelists and facilitating the discussion, I'll also be taking questions from you and posing them to our panelists. During our discussion, you may send your questions to us on Twitter at UDCDS using the hashtag CDS25. Or if you're here in the auditorium, you have the opportunity to jot down questions on the cards you were given when you arrived today. And if you would pass them to your right, we will collect them from the folks on the right aisle. Um, so let's begin. Before diving into what can be done to get more people with disabilities to vote, we really need to understand better why they vote in disproportionately low numbers. Rabia, perhaps you can get us started by telling us a bit about what got us here about some of the historical obstacles people with disabilities have faced and why society and political power brokers over and over again made it so difficult for them to vote. So thank you for that and thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Um, so one of the big problems with um, the fact that people with disabilities don't vote in proportion to their numbers is that historically we haven't considered them truly part of our political community. Um, so in the time period that I study in the 1800s, we see people with disabilities that were shunted off into institutions, ostracized, stigmatized, and forgotten. Gotten. So people were put into asylums, they were put in poor houses, um, different types of schools, really warehoused. And those people who are within those institutions were either disenfranchised because they lived there, um, or people didn't go there to help them to vote. For people that were not in those institutions and they were living within the community, for people who had physical disabilities, they didn't receive any type of accommodations um, to be able to vote. So if they were able to get themselves to the polling place, perhaps they would be able to vote. But um, it would be difficult, say, if someone was blind and they received a paper ballot that they weren't able to read, or in the time before that, when we did voice voting uh, with people who were deaf, that. Uh, wouldn't be able to participate in the vote. And then people with, with mental disabilities who were disenfranchised based on their mental status, and in many states still disenfranchised based on their mental status. When we started deinstitutionalizing and moving people out of institutions in the 20th century, we have some laws that 
do um, provide some types of accommodations for people at polling places, but it's still quite difficult for people to be able to access polling places, people to receive the accommodations that are legally mandated when they get to the polling places. And I think we still have this cultural lag where we don't really expect people with disabilities to be voters. That's not a proud chapter in our country's history. Right. Um, but this is one that, this is an issue that applies to not just Americans with disabilities, but to people around the world. Um, Virginia, you spend a lot of your time overseas working to ensure that people with disabilities are included and have appropriate access. Can you tell us about that? Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I think it'd be helpful to also just note the, the one in five number that was given at the beginning, the estimate of Americans with disabilities, is actually higher in many of the countries where IFAS works. Um, and that's because of poor health care, because of post-conflict. So in many of the countries where I'm working, the proportion of people with disabilities is actually you know, 20, 25% of the population. So this is a huge chunk of the population that we're leaving out of the political process. Um, people with disabilities in countries around the world experience similar barriers to here, but they're often compounded. Um, and sometimes it's compounded by US and European governments' um, development policies, actually. So for example, physical barriers, which I think is the most common thing that everyone thinks of when they think of barriers to the political process. Um, I was just in Armenia last year, ahead of their elections, went to multiple different polling stations. I didn't see any that were physically accessible, not a one. Yet, um, one of the big international observer groups, uh, I will not name them, <laughs> but one of the big, you know, well-respected international observer groups published their report after that election and said that about 75% of polling stations were physically accessible. So I went to our disabled persons organization partner and I said, hey, you know, I, I didn't see any of these polling stations. Do you agree with these numbers? And they were also upset and said, if anything, the numbers are, are opposite. You know, 75% are not accessible. So I talked to the International Observer Group, and they said, well, we decided that if there was just two or three stairs, then we would say that that polling station was accessible. <laughs> you know, and this is, this is a European you know, International Observer Organization. So imagine how disempowering that is to the disability community when this international observation group tells the government, you know, gold star, 75% of your polling stations are physically accessible how disempowering that is to the disability community in that country to then try and advocate with the government for change when they're like, hey, the, the international observers disagree with you and said that you know, actually the polling stations are accessible. So this is one big problem um, in terms of political participation and access. There's also similar barriers like you would encounter here related to information, for example but they're severely compounded. Um, in the Dominican Republic, we worked with the election commission there to finally convince them to include sign language interpreters in all of their videos for their voter education for the first time. So we were really excited, this is a win. Then we find out there's only two <laughs> fully accredited sign language interpreters in the country. <laughs> You know, so it, it makes, even when you, you get the government to agree to these, um, to include the sign language interpreters, it makes it incredibly difficult to actually implement. There's also legal and policy barriers. Um, most countries around the world disenfranchise people with intellectual or psychosocial disabilities, either directly or indirectly. Um, there's barriers related to policy. So for example, in many countries, um, quite a few countries in the Caribbean, they don't have any assistive devices to allow voters who are blind to vote on their own and unaided. So what they do is allow you to have an assistant. This is fine, you know, that's compliant with the UN Disability Treaty, which says uh, voters with disabilities should be allowed an assistant of their own choosing to mark their ballot if they would like. But the way that they implement it then is problematic. Um, so the voter has to pronounce loudly in the polling station their intention, who they would like to vote for. And all, an observer from each of the different political parties has to watch the assistant mark the ballot to make sure that the assistant marks the ballot the way that the voter pronounced. So they think they're doing this to prevent fraud, to, you know, make sure that you know, the voter's intention is met, but then they're not thinking about the secrecy of the ballot for these people. Um, so there's all sorts of problems like this in terms of implementation as well, even when there's, there's good intentions. Um, I'd also like to say that it's, all of these barriers are compounded for women with disabilities, for youth with disabilities, um, people from ethnic or religious minorities. All of the barriers that you would experience, for example, because of your gender are then compounded in addition to having a disability. So women with disabilities in particular are very marginalized from the political process. 
And then the last thing that is maybe a little bit different than here in the context in the US that really disproportionately impacts the political participation of voters with disabilities is uh, conflict or violence, you know, or even the threat thereof. So I've, I've trained observers with disabilities, for example, in Kenya for their elections last year, last August. Um, and one woman who used crutches was saying, what do I do if, if something, if there's conflict in the polling station? You know, how do I get away? And this is something that quite a few of the women in Kenya expressed, um, but none of the men, even men with physical disabilities, had that concern. You know, so there's this added insecurity, this added issue that disproportionately impacts women with disabilities, either conflict directly or the threat of conflict. Um, so I, I can go on and talk about many more barriers. I'll, I'll leave it there, though, I think. Well, we will hear much more from Virginia. So fortunately, here in the US, we're better off than we once were, <clears throat> but we're certainly not where we need to be. Um, Rabia, can you talk about some of the reforms that did drive these improvements? Well, um, in terms of the reforms generally with respect to voting and disabilities, mm -hmm. so there were a few sort of statutory revolutions that we had. One was the Voting Rights Act, um, which was fought for mostly by African Americans to um, reverse the massive disenfranchisement that happened um, uh, starting in the South and then sort of moving out for the rest of the country. Um, sort of targeting sort of black people who wish to vote. Um, so the Voting Rights Act also protects now sort of people um, with disabilities. The, the problem is, though, that it's being steadily whittled back by the Supreme Court. Um, we also have uh, disability-specific um, statutory laws, such as the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, the problem there, though, is that it is also something that is, provides fairly thin protection. So we're still debating whether or not people can receive access to um, a full independent and private vote um, that's still being litigated under the, the ADA. Um, and then with sort of more recent sort of voting statutes, uh, especially that happened after Bush v. Gore, it's just like the Help America Vote Act, and the nickname is that it didn't. Um, that um, that was supposed to provide funding and regulatory um, sort of push to get um, us to modernize our voting practices, but also that hasn't really happened very much. So people with mental disabilities are largely left out um, of this legislation. Uh, the vote, the funding has really sort of dried up, and then we also have a current uh, administration that hasn't really made voting access a priority. Indeed, it's done the opposite in terms of putting roadblocks in the way of allowing people to be able to vote. Well, we'll explore some of those issues in more detail in just a bit. I encountered a, a disturbing term in my research, and that's voter suppression. Intentional attempts to silence a constituency. Restrictions make it harder to register to vote, to cast a ballot, or to have a vote counted. And a stunning number of restrictive bills have been introduced in states across the country, ostensibly to combat voter fraud, but effectively making it difficult, if not impossible, for marginalized populations to actually be able to cast a vote. Uh, comments from anyone on the, that point. What are some of the things that are being done to keep people from the polls? Um, I, I could speak to this a little bit, I suppose. I, I think that there are um, a couple consequences here of what we're currently seeing in terms of voter suppression. The first is we talked a little bit about federal law, but the majority of election laws are actually a matter of state law. Mm -hmm. uh, states and local jurisdictions are primarily responsible for how our elections are run, so we're seeing a lot of changes in state law in terms of things like uh, stricter voter ID requirements, which are done um, as, as a state a goal to deter fraud, but actually create barriers for all types of voters, and in particular for voters with disabilities. And there, this has been stu studied, there have been reports issued that show that the majority of Americans live you know, 10 miles or more from 
a, an office that can issue the correct type of photo ID that's open more than two days a week. Uh, 10 miles is a really long distance, especially when you're talking about the majority of the United States where there isn't sometimes any public transit to speak of, certainly not uh, efficient and accessible public transit. Mm -hmm. That could be an insurmountable distance for some people, especially when you get there and you find out it may not be compliant with the ADA. There are DMV offices that you can't get into, or they have really high countertops and they've bolted down the camera to it. So you have to have a photo ID, which means they have to take your photo, but they can't tilt the camera to take a picture of you sitting in your wheelchair. What do we do when that happens? People end up in this catch-22 where they have to have this ID that they can't get their hands on. Uh, those, those create barriers for voters. I think we're also seeing some changes just in terms of the um, height and tension around how we run our elections. We are getting reports coming in from voters that increasingly they are going in to vote and being questioned about the type of ID they're bringing. People with disabilities are being questioned about their competency to vote by poll workers who don't have the right to ask mm -hmm. those questions if you're on the rolls and you're there to vote. Um, we are getting more pushback. Our, our network in particular, um, NDRN's network, goes out and surveys polling places. To, to determine their accessibility and to make recommend, recommendations for changes that can be made to adapt that polling place and make it more accessible. Increasingly, we're being told we're not going to be allowed inside polling places to do that work. So we can't even get in there to see what's happening, all because of this heightened tension around who's in the polling place and what are they doing there and what's happening. Uh, so I think we're seeing some changes in state laws that are creating new barriers for voters. But I think we're also seeing changes just in um, in the more um, less regulated sphere of how we run our elections. Just some of those things that happen specifically on election day, which for the voter, election day is everything. Whatever laws we have in place, um, you know, we, I think that the ADA has some great standards in it. I think the ADA has some decent teeth, but if it's not being followed and it's not being enforced, it doesn't matter to the voter who can't get in that polling place on election day. What happens on election day is everything for the voter in terms of whether or not you're going to be able to actually cast that ballot. Uh, and we're, we're seeing a lot of changes in how things are actually being conducted on election day that I think are having a really big impact and are much harder to capture in, in terms of data, in terms of what's happening to voters with disabilities. On what basis are they saying that you, your um, colleagues aren't welcome to come in and take a look at the polling places? So there are state laws that regulate that sort of thing. Who can be in the polling place? Someone who's actively casting a ballot, someone who is assisting a person cast a ballot, that right that you have under the Voting Rights Act to have an, anyone you want come with you to assist you. Uh, whatever the state laws are around poll watchers and observers, uh, elections officials, the press, all of that is pretty tightly controlled. Mm -hmm. um, so the state has a lot of power to determine who can come in and who cannot, which I think in many ways is a good thing. Uh, but we also have to think, be mindful of who our allies are, who are trying to help us to make elections run better and work better for all uh, when we start kind of tightening that control on who we're letting into the polling place. Other comments on tactics to prevent people from being able to cast a ballot? I think one other thing, too, is that um, there were efforts previously to try to allow people a longer time to be able to vote, so not just the day of uh, sort of a classic election, which there is law that you are supposed to be able to leave your job to be able to vote, but then also to be able to both register and then also vote prior to um, election day. Um, and that's being tightened yeah. as well. So it's much harder to, in many states, to do same day registration. But then also the window to be able to vote is um, rapidly closing so that uh, for people that do have difficulty sort of coordinating to be able to go to a polling place before they had multiple days to do that and it's getting a lot harder now. Yeah. I, th I think lack of compliance with the ADA is also be going, going to become a very big issue in the world of voting rights, which is interesting because it's not by any means a new issue. Mm -hmm. um, there's, 
there's always been a lack of compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, in all types of um, public spaces since it became law. It's been a known problem with polling places for as long as we've had the ADA. I will say we've made some progress, and we have the data to show that. The US Government Accountability Office surveys polling places going back to 2000. Uh, their most recent report around the 2016 elections found that 40% of our polling places had no potential impediments to people with disabilities. Now that's still less than half. So that's not good news, uh, but to give you a sense of where we're at, I was relieved when I got that in hand and I thought, oh good, 40%, because it's an increase mm -hmm. over what it looked like in 2008 and 2000. We're still going in the right direction, very slowly, but we're still going in the right direction. So we've seen some progress, but we still have less than half of America's polling places actually compliant with the law. That in itself, to me, is a form of voter suppression. Mm -hmm. If we had over half of America's polling places, a particular type of person couldn't get in, we would call that what it is. Uh, if 60% of America's polling places were only accessible to men, if 60% of America's polling places were only accessible to people who are white, we would not let that stand. Uh, but that's essentially what's happening to people with disabilities. That, to me, is a form of voter suppression. We're taking far too long to solve those issues, so many of which are very, very solvable. But now we're seeing a new emerging issue uh, in the now infamous Randolph County, Georgia, that has very few polling places. They have nine, but they plan to close seven of them. And they claimed it was because they weren't compliant with the ADA, which is really interesting to me uh, when you want to do that right before a major midterm election in a voting jurisdiction that's predominantly African American and used to be covered by federal preclearance under the Voting Rights Act. I think we have to ask the question if we know that non-compliance with the ADA is a problem all over the country, and it has been since the ADA passed, why this one county and why right now are they suddenly so concerned about making these changes that they have to close 80% of their polling places? Mm -hmm. um, they don't is the answer to that question. That, that to me is a smokescreen for another form of voter suppression. So I think that the ADA is really so important to, to so many aspects of American life for people with disabilities, but it also can't be weaponized against us. And so we really have to continue to push for that full ADA compliance. I, I don't think any of us have any intention of backing down from that whatsoever. Uh, if anything, I'd argue we should double down because I will not be scared away from pushing for full compliance with the ADA. But we're going to have to watch for this new rising issue as well of these polling place closures that are being blamed on us. Uh, and really have nothing to do with us. So I think that um, the ADA is going to become a really, really crucial issue, I think, in voter suppression of people with disabilities going forward. Thank you. Legal capacity arguments. Virginia, you touched on this before. It's an issue here. It's an issue across the world. Um, people with intellectual disabilities, mental health conditions, other kinds of disabilities. Can you tell us more about that? Sure. Um, in a majority of the countries around the world, actually, people with intellectual disabilities are either directly or indirectly um, disenfranchised. Um, for example, if you're under guardianship in most countries, you're not allowed to vote. And this is in spite of recent court cases that have actually ruled in favor um, of the voter. So, for example, there's a court case in 2010, um, Kiss versus Hungary, where um, a man from Hungary was under guardianship and sued his country to get his right to vote back and lost, but then took it up to the European Court of Human Rights where he won. So in theory, all countries, which are most of Europe and even beyond Europe are members of the European Court of Human Rights, should be changing their laws. And that's not happening. Um, there was also a case about four years ago in Japan where a young woman who had always voted um, turned up to vote and her name had been taken off the list. And this is because the Japanese government had changed the, regis the, the, the legislation and decided, okay, anyone under guardianship can't vote anymore. And it's without announcement, it's without any sort of public debate or campaign, um, they just changed the law. So she also sued in, in Japan and won her right to vote back, and that then meant the whole law had to change, which they actually did do. In less than a year, Japan changed their law back, and anyone under guardianship there now can vote. Um, there's also a lot of issues um, here in the US, but also in particular in other countries around the world of sort of paternalism and, and patronizing people with intellectual or psychosocial disabilities. Um, so for example, in Peru, uh, the government there, it's, it's required to vote. All citizens, mandatory, you must vote. And if you don't, you're actually charged a fine that comes out of your paycheck or comes out of your taxes. You know, they get it from you somehow. 
And the government decided that they would be helpful to people with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities and take them off the voters list because they assumed they weren't going to be voting anyway and then this way they wouldn't have to pay the fine. So again, something that they did without consultation with the disability community, without announcing it, just something that they implemented, you know, undercover. And then again, voters turned up that had always voted their entire life and found that their names were no longer on the voters list. So there was a huge campaign in Peru as well that thankfully also has reversed that law and educated a lot of people in the region as well about the fact that there are many people with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities that frequently vote, that are frequently educated on the topics more so than many other voters are, and that you can't just change these laws without consultation with the disability community. Um, there's a lot of problems as well, even just we're an international organization, but we're based in the U.S. So it's really difficult for me to come as an American to other countries and, and say, hey, you know, you need to change your laws to comply with the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, because then I'm often told, well, the US doesn't have, <laughs> you know, you haven't changed your laws in this way and you haven't ratified the UN Disability Treaty. Um, so the, the things that are happening here in the US are noticed in other countries, um, and for, for better or worse. Thank you. Well, you mentioned guardianship, and guardianship is a very hot topic in our country right now for any number of reasons. Um, Michelle, how does the issue of guardianship interface with participation in elections here in this country? Um, so it's, it's exactly what, what we're hearing, that in the majority of states there is some type of law on the books in which you can be stripped of your right to vote through the guardianship process. And those laws vary, they're all a little different, so it's, it's a bit of a, a jumbled confusion of laws. Some of them, older laws, still have language in them that say idiots and insane persons, um, up to adjudicated incompetent. So, and, and how they work in terms of whether or not it's a, a full guardianship or a partial guardianship, and can they write into the paperwork that you retain your right to vote, or do they have to say, write into the paperwork that you lose your right to vote, otherwise you get to retain it. They're all a little different. Um, so, for, I would say first and foremost, if there's anyone watching who has a guardian who wants to vote, pull that paperwork and let's take a look at it. We, we do a lot of this work directly with voters and find that often, Actually, very interestingly, in some cases, there is no guardian. Someone has a mom or dad who always has called themselves the guardian, but they never actually got that established. So that person is legally their own guardian and never lost the right to vote. But how it's written up can also be quite confusing. And someone may or may not really realize whether or not they've lost the right to vote until you've taken a look at it. You can also always go to court and get that right restored. And I would absolutely urge anyone to do that who's lost their right to vote. Um, but I think that these laws are still on the books for exactly the reasons we're talking about today. It's um, a complete misunderstanding of what it means to be a person with a disability, especially people with intellectual disabilities, who we still think of as being unintelligent and childlike, and that's simply not true. Um, people with disabilities are no less prepared than anyone else to cast their vote. Um, it, it's, it's really no different. There are a lot of people with intellectual disabilities or mental illness who have very good reasons for who they want to vote for. They know exactly who they want to vote for and it's in their best interest and they're good reasons. And some of them have terrible reasons for who they want to vote for. But so does everyone else. Um, I, if you think of your own friends and family members, I bet you can think of a lot of people who you think are very well informed to make a great decision, and then the person who votes for the person they want to have a beer with. Why is that how we pick a president, right? And so it's, it's just people with disabilities aren't any different than non-disabled voters. But when you don't have a disability, whether or not you should get to cast your terribly uneducated vote is never <laughs> called into question. You just get to do it because you're an American, but so are people with developmental and, and disabilities and mental illness. It's just a complete misunderstanding of what that means, and I think that um, some of that is so informed even by our horrible, horrible pop culture around disability. Any mainstream portrayals of people with mental illness would have you believe that everyone who has a mental illness is completely out of touch with reality and dangerous. Um, thanks for that, shows like Law and Order. Uh, but that's not, that's not true. That's not in any way true. That's not the reality. And so there are people out there who are losing their right to vote on the basis of their identity who are no different from any other voter. And really, to me, this should be the issue of our time because it's 2018 and we are the last demographic in the country that can be legally stripped of the right to vote purely based on your identity. And, and I can't believe that we are allowing that to stand in the United States, which by all means should be the model for other countries. And we're being called to the carpet on this, and we should be. It, it shouldn't be happening. People are losing their right to vote, especially when you think about people 
who are at the greatest risk for living in institutional settings, where so much of your life is determined by your government, and then your government takes away your right to have a say in how they're treating you. That, to me, is, is a form of slavery. That's not OK. Um, so that, to me, that if we were to take up one cause as a people, that, to me, should be the issue of our time, getting these types of laws banned at the federal level. But I think it's also something that um, disability advocacy groups need to foreground as well. I mean, I think that that's something where it hasn't been foregrounded even by advocacy groups in terms of people that have mental disabilities and um, just blatant, as you say, a sort of disenfranchisement has not been on the table. So if we look at, say, disability laws, why is it that when um, the ADA was uh, dealing with voting that we did not talk about people who were stripped of their vote based on sort of mental status. I think part of it is that there's always been this um, assumption for people with any type of disabilities that they are mentally incompetent. And one of the things that people with non-mental disabilities have used to sort of leverage themselves out of that is to say that we're not like them. Yep. Um, so historically, for instance, with um, deaf voters who were were questioned um, because their deafness was assumed to be something that indicated mental incompetency. The move was to say, we are not like the people who um, have intellectual disabilities. So the people with intellectual disabilities stayed disenfranchised, mm -hmm. while people who were deaf or other types of physical disabilities were able to gain the vote. So we need to stop that type of divide um, and conquer sort of mechanism to try to sort of gain some type of rights, too. Mm -hmm. That's so true. And I think the important thing about guardianship is that no one is going to have a guardianship established because they want to take away somebody's right to vote. That is not what families are thinking about when they go to have a guardianship established. They're thinking about really practical matters like someone who just needs some assistance managing their finances mm -hmm. or making important health care decisions, which right. quite frankly, who doesn't? If that's the standard, I could use a guardian because I could definitely use help managing my finances. Um, <laughs> But these are the things they're thinking about. And then you go before a judge one day, and they just check a box and take away your right to vote for the rest of your life. And, and that's not what families are asking for. Some of them don't, don't even know this is this going to happen until after it's already happened. And it's, um, it, it's not even very well regulated. So these are being done by like probate judges. These are being done county by county. So there are some judges that check that box as a matter of routine, and there are some that won't touch it with a barge pole. And so whether or not you're going to lose your right to vote could be determined just by what county you live in. It could be that if you move two blocks over, this never would have happened to you. Uh, that's just that to me is just not in any way equal protection under the law. It, it's just not OK. And this is not what people are seeking when they have a guardianship established. I think we need to start thinking about, even in the broader sense, much more practical things like exploring supported decision making uh, in a much larger way to respect the dignity of the person and in their own self-determination when someone maybe just needs a little extra support, which who doesn't? Well, I was sharing with the panel earlier this morning that the other day a University of Delaware student was telling me about having interviewed a person with an intellectual disability and learned that that person who lives in a group home was never given the option to cast a ballot um, because the people at the home assumed that they had no interest and had nothing to contribute. And in fact, um, the, most national, the most recent national data compiled by the National Court Indicators Initiative revealed that 61% of respondents hadn't voted in a local, a state, or a federal election. And so it, it goes beyond the legal system to others who are um, in a position to either facilitate or hinder the um, the right for someone to be engaged in that manner. Helena? Yeah, I, I think what we're talking about to some degree to what you just mentioned is attitudinal barriers. Mm -hmm. And people with disabilities face that all the time, right? Why is the unemployment rate so high? I mean, there are systemic issues, but it's also attitudinal. And it's, you can't legislate attitudinal barriers, right? The ADA is a great piece of civil rights law, but it's not going to, you know, 
legislate, like I say, the attitudinal barriers. So we have to educate our community um, and caregivers, et cetera, and you have to educate you know, our politicians. I mean, it's society in general, the way people with disabilities are being perceived. So that may mean you're not, you know, you don't think that they can vote, you don't think they can have a job, you don't think they could, you know, get married and have a family, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a much bigger societal issue that we're encountering. And it's one of the hardest issues, I think, for somebody who's been doing this work a long time is breaking down those barriers. I think the ADA has helped because things are more accessible. You see more people out and about with disabilities. Uh, but I do think it's one of our major barriers. The other thing we haven't talked about is there are two million people with disabilities living in institutions who many times don't get to see an absentee ballot. I know that there are some in your network that are trying to get into those institutions to ensure people can vote. Many times it's, it's not happening. Well, we are going to talk about some of those positive strategies a little bit later in our time together. Matt, did you have anything you wanted to add here? No, well, I mean, the, the, the attitudinal issue, I realize, is not specifically necessary, specific necessarily to voting. But I do think that one advantage of being in a small state like Delaware is that when we are talking about employment issues and, and things of that nature, that it is possible to, uh, to make an impact on that front uh, more readily than you might be able to on a national scale or in a, broader st in a larger state. Uh, so for example, we have a, a supermarket chain in Delaware uh, that has been very good about uh, hiring individuals with disabilities, giving them positions of responsibility, and has come to believe that they're actually some of their best, most reliable, hardest working employees, and they have been great ambassadors to the other supermarket chains in the state. Mm -hmm. uh, when I would go out in, in one of my prior elected jobs and try to pitch the supermarkets on hiring more individuals with disabilities, I'm a politician. They, you know, they're not going to listen to me about how to run their supermarket. Uh, but when they have uh, someone else who's running a successful supermarket chain right. get on the phone with them and talk about their personal experience, that, that has impact. And I've seen that on a, on a number of other fronts in some of our, our larger industries. So I think that, you know, on that, on that specific issue, which isn't really, you're correct, a legal issue, I think that there's a lot of potential at the state level in Delaware, and we've, we've actually seen some, some uh, limited success stories. Indeed. Well, I'm surprised that so far our conversation hasn't focused on uh, the literal accessibility of polling places. We touched on it, but you know there are physical barriers just getting into the building. Um, the burden of waiting online for half an hour or an hour for someone who has a mobility limitation. And of course, issues with accessible voting machines actually working and the poll workers knowing how to uh, engage with that technology. Who would like to talk about that? Oh, that old thing, that's not a big issue at all. Um, I think, um, V voting equipment, in particular, I think is going to is continues to be another really key issue, especially because we're looking at making some pretty serious changes to some of the voting equipment that we're using, and really moving much back towards paper-based systems, which are just inherently inaccessible. Um, I'm not necessarily opposed to paper entirely. I use paper every day. Um, but if, if that's what we're going to need for security, then you got to show me how we're also going to make it fully accessible to everyone to be able to vote with privacy and independence. And we haven't quite figured that out yet. Uh, there aren't any market-ready voting systems that have completely solved that problem. So that's something that I think we're going to have to continue looking at. But I think one of the other big issues there you kind of hit on is this idea of poll workers who, you know, when we talk about that, it all comes down to what happens on election day. We can have amazing voting systems, we can have great legal protections in place, but if the poll workers are terrified of that voting machine because no one trained them how to use it, then it, things are not going to go well on election day. And that's something that we do see happening. Sometimes it's still in a box in a corner and it's never been taken out and plugged in and turned on, so it's not ready to use. And then you as the voter who needs it, have to be the one to advocate for yourself to these poll workers who might give you pushback if they haven't been trained to use that machine and they're a little bit scared and they don't want to take it out and set it up. And no voter should have to do that. No voter should have to have that um, intimidating of an experience at the polls. But we're still seeing some of that happening. I think, to me, talking about you know some more solutions-focused ideas, I think that we all need, we need to stop segregating how we vote. 
Um, I think we need to stop having systems where we assume that the majority of voters are going to be non-disabled people who are going to come in and hand mark a piece of paper and leave, and we'll have this one system set up here for anyone who can't do that. Uh, that to me is a form of segregation. Uh, which we all get very comfortable with when it comes to voting. When people want to vote on paper, we're suddenly okay with the, with the idea that separate can somehow be equal, although I thought we had learned that lesson in the United States. So I, I think if everyone was voting the same method, if we were all coming in, even if it's paper-based, if we all came in and used the touch screen that marked the paper for you, we would start to see a lot of those problems evaporate because you would have to train your poll workers on how to use all the features of the machine because everyone who comes in there is going to use it that day. It has to be set up and turned on. You have to have enough tech people ready to respond to, uh, you know, a lot of times the issues they have are really small things like it really just needs to be recalibrated, which is a thing that happens to touch screens. Uh, but you have to have someone on hand to be able to do that. A lot of the issues that we see, I think, would disappear if everyone was voting the same method and we weren't creating sort of a separate ghettoized way for people with disabilities to vote, uh, that we don't necessarily want to put all the resources in terms of time and money into resolving those issues for them. And I, there are some places where they're doing this and I think that it's working. At the very least, offering either method of voting to every person who comes into the polling place. Uh, if you know every single person who comes in today, you're going to ask them if they want to take a piece of paper or they want to use the touch screen, you better have the touch screen turned on and <laughs> know that it's working properly. Um, and we're not, we're not doing that everywhere. I think we need to end the, the segregation of how we vote and we need to bring voters with disabilities into the mainstream. I think one thing that, that's hard is that there's so little funding for it. Yeah. I mean, voting is, is sort of odd because we consider it to be something that's so important, um, yet it's sort of like a donut legally. So we don't actually have the right to vote. Um, so there's some state constitutions that have the right to vote, but if you look at the US Constitution, there is no right to vote. It's not there. Um, so it's hard to get partially, in some ways, like sort of the affirmative protections to help uh, facilitate the right to vote. But then in terms of the, the way that the mechanism is, we have this essentially volunteer labor force that shows up suddenly um, that is supposed to help us vote and then melts away again. We don't give them a lot of training. We don't get a, give, give states and localities a lot of money um, to try to get these machines. So it's, it seems we are really sort of using uh, voting and like we put duct tape all over it and then we expect it to work well yes. for us. Yeah. I, I agree completely and I think in terms of even just the voting equipment, those are private for-profit companies mm -hmm. that develop these systems and then sell them to states and counties. If you are a company that's capable of making technology, this is not a big money market. You're not going to get rich off making voting machines. So we get what we get until Congress puts the money where their mouth is and starts funding some of this stuff so that companies can actually make a dollar off this. Uh, and I think that we need to put more money into research and development funding. We, we have the solutions that we have because there's only so much money to go around and there's only so much money you're ever going to make off this if you develop a really great voting system that is both accessible and secure. Uh, let's let's put some some federal dollars into this to support that research and development so people will start making better solutions. And I want the states to stand up, who, who are the real customer for these companies that make voting machines, and start demanding better products. I can demand a better product all day long, but I don't buy voting equipment because I don't run elections anywhere, uh, except in my own mind where I always win. <laughs> so we need, I think the states need to get together and say, I want to see something as fully accessible and fully secure and I want you to make it and I'm not going to give you my money until you do and I think we would start seeing some better solutions. Yeah, I'd say internationally though, most laws in other countries, the right, right to vote is protected. Mm -hmm. You know, majority of other constitutions around the world, it's actually in there, you know, on paper, it, either in the constitution or in an election law and it comes down to implementation and enforcement again. It comes down to the poll worker issue. Mm -hmm. You know, poll workers are not trained on, for example, um, in one country, I will not name them, but they developed a tactile ballot guide so that people who are blind could vote on their own unaided. I'm, you know, walking around different polling stations, I don't see the tactile ballot guides out anywhere. <laughs> so I asked one poll worker, you know, where are the tactile ballot guides? And he didn't know what they were. <laughs> and then went looking through the box, and they're still sitting in the box. He's like, oh, is this it? I was like, yes, <laughs> that is it. Um, another country I saw, the, the tactile ballot guides were at least sitting on the table. I saw a blind voter, you know, approach the desk with a, a family member, I assume, 
and he wasn't, the poll workers didn't even offer him the tactile ballot guide. Didn't say, I see you have an assistant with you, but would you like to use the tactile ballot guide so you can vote on your own? Didn't even mention it. So after the voter had left, I, I asked the poll workers again, why didn't you offer the tactile ballot guide to him? And they were like, oh, well, that was his son that was with him. You know, because these are all such small communities, they all know each other. You know, so they just assumed the poll worker made the decision on their own that he would prefer to have his son help him cast his ballot rather than use the assistive device. And when these kinds of things happen where poll workers aren't trained and then the election commission sees that these assistive devices are not being used, they think, well, why do we spend all that money on that if nobody's going to use it? So it creates this, this sort of vicious cycle where voters are not even informed that there are these assistive devices available, poll workers are not trained on how to use them, or even if they are, make their own decisions about whether the voter would like to use them or not. Um, there's also been many times where I've seen, you know, disability advocates um, push for a queue jumping policy, you know, so that voters with disabilities don't have to stand in the line all day. And they finally get that, but then the poll workers just decide on their own, oh, well, we don't, you know, we don't feel like implementing that because it requires that they have one of the poll workers out in the queue kind of searching for voters with disabilities and telling them they can go to the front, and they decide that they don't want to do that. You know, so a lot of this is also, again, getting down to the fact that it's, it's people that are hired for the day, you know, and they're just there temporarily. There's not much accountability there when you know you're only here for a one-day job and you maybe will never do it again, or if you do do it again, it's going to be in four or five years. Um, so even if we do have eventually a better legal structure, there's still these practical issues in terms of implementation, um, in particular with the poll workers, um, that I think we would still even have here in the U.S. It gives you strong incentives to do voter suppression as well, because um, you know that every election is going to essentially be a one-shot deal. So if you do a lot of things that throw mayhem into the election, sure, you can litigate afterwards, but there's not a lot of um, sort of bite to any of that regulatory work that happens then. You may get some sort of court opinion that says that the election was screwed up, but then what are you doing at that point? That voter that gets suppressed may never come back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you know that it's not just that that particular election is messed up, but then you may be able to get the other side to have diminished ranks for decades to come. Matt? Yeah, I mean, a corollary to, to some of this is you, you don't see very much uh, litigation with some of the statutes that we do have. And, and a couple of the panelists have mentioned, you know, starting in the mid-70s, you have Americans with Disabilities Act, Help America Vote Act, Rehabilitation Act. There are federal statutes on the books, but most of them, by their nature, are complicated to enforce. They involve making initial showings and people being able to rebut the showings. Uh, so they are, and they all overlap with each other in ways that people disagree about. Um, it's it's pretty difficult. Well, it's impossible for a layperson to make their way through the courts with it. And even for some of the organizations that that litigate these cases, uh, they take years. Uh, they're they're very expensive to litigate, uh, and partly for that reason, there aren't a lot of them. Uh, and um, one, you know, one means of going about trying to address that is trying to make it more. Uh, economically feasible uh, for some of those statutes to be enforced. Uh, and then again, just once again, flipping back to Delaware, um, about 10 years ago, we changed some of our fee shifting provisions in our special education enforcement statute in a way that was designed to make it more feasible for, for some of these uh, student IEP cases to actually be litigated and, and have families able to, to try to enforce some of their statutory rights. And over the course of the last 10 years, it has really fundamentally changed um, the way that those cases are handled at the school level. And once, once it's possible for people to actually be able to privately litigate with the statute and enforce their rights, then people on the other end of it start paying more attention to, uh, to compliance, and it really sort of changes facts on the ground. So I think that some attention being paid to actually making it possible for individuals with disabilities and their attorneys to I'm a lawyer, so you know part of my solution to everything is always more lawyers. Uh, but I, I, I do I do actually believe that in this instance, um, that uh, you know making it possible to have those existing statutes enforced in a more robust way uh, has some promise. 
Right. And I, yeah, and I think, I mean, from where the lawyers are sort of bookended here, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in terms of not just attorney's fees, but then also some sense of damages, because that doesn't happen now. So if you slip and fall, then you're going to be caught by all the lawyers that <laughs> want to bring your lawsuit, because they're going to get money um, if you collect money. That's not the case with respect to voting. Um, and so there's this like, expectation in some ways that nonprofit groups are going to do it because this is something that's important, but you can't eat important. <laughs> and then we expect the Department of Justice also to bring a lot of these lawsuits as well. They're not doing that right now. They don't. So then there's no bite on sort of the back end. Yeah. You know, as we're having this conversation, I'm reminded it was either in 86 or 88, there was a federal law passed specifically talking about accessibility of polling places and the states needed to comply and they needed to send in, I don't remember the particulars, but they had to send in, maybe it was once a year, maybe it was every couple of years, the status of their accessible polling places. That was 86, 88, you know, so it goes back to, you know, poor enforcement, states weren't doing it, there was no teeth, there were no consequences, and you know, here we are in, you know, 30 years later and we're having the same conversation, but there was a law that was specifically just about polling place accessibility that predated the ADA. And like I said, um, it's very common, I think, in our community that we have these conversations for like the last 20, 30 years, <laughs> trying to figure how we can you know, rectify um, these issues, but uh, as you can see, it's, it's, not, it's not easy. I think one of the ways to do it, though, is, is by voting. I mean, clearly, we need to have more people with disabilities, their family members, voting to want to try to have some sort of impact on the policies. Um, you know, when you had 30, over 35 million eligible voters with disabilities in 2016, family members brought it up to over 60 million. That's a quarter of the electorate. I mean, we could have a really powerful impact and be that voting block and see some, you know, make, start making some real changes. But I also think our, our community has to take some responsibility as well, even though we know there are a ton of barriers out there, but we also have to take responsibility. Well, I'm going to interject a question that we got from our audience, and this is specifically for Michelle and Matt. Given that states set some of their own election policies, is voter suppression of people with disabilities a partisan issue? And how so? How can we combat that? That's a great question I wish I had an answer to. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. It shouldn't be. I can, I can absolutely say it shouldn't be there. Uh, people with disabilities are a huge potential voting block because there's just so many of us. And I know the numbers say we're one in five. I think that's low. I think there's way more of us than that that we're just not really capturing yet. But we are incredibly diverse. And so we're not just a huge block of potential voters. We're a huge swing vote. We absolutely do not vote one way or another. Uh, we're not liberal or conservative. We're not um, Democrats or Republicans. So I, that's, to me, what's so interesting about some of this is that there shouldn't be any partisan motivation to this, to whether or not we're creating full access to the vote. I mean, there never should be a partisan motivation as to whether or not we're going to allow everybody to vote. But we know that that happens. We have a lot of, a lot of very unfortunate history in the United States that shows us that. Uh, with people with disabilities, it should be a non-issue uh, because we, we are a swing vote. Um, we should have full access, and if you want us, you've got to get out there and woo us. Um, candidates aren't even largely speaking about us. There are very few candidate platforms that include disability rights issues. We're not really spoken about in the public discourse, so um, I, I don't know that there's any reason for us to be particularly partisan one way or another. Nobody's really out there trying to secure our vote yet. Uh, I, I hope we change that when we start voting in larger numbers. So it shouldn't be a particularly partisan issue. I think that there's a lot of other stuff bundled up in this. I think that non-disabled people don't think about disability for the large part. And I think there is a lot to that that doesn't have anything to do with partisan politics. I think that our entire culture has trained them not to think about it. Um, someone was just asking me about this the other day and I said, when's the last time you watched a movie with a love plot where one of the, one of the lovers had a disability? 
It doesn't happen. So your whole life, you grew up watching Disney movies, and then you watch romantic comedies, and they train you what to expect from love, and what they train you is to never expect to fall in love with a person with a disability. So we don't think about people with disabilities. Our whole culture trains us not to think about people with disabilities. So when we go to make these types of decisions, we don't think about people with disabilities. Uh, it's wrong, but it's really far-reaching in our society. So I don't know that there's so much a partisan motivation as it is. We don't think about it. And when we're asked to by people with disabilities, I think it makes us a little uncomfortable. I think the one thing that's really different about people with disabilities as, uh, as a, a group of people in the United States is that we, we are the one that you can join at any time, whether or not you want to, quite frankly. Um, I won't wake up tomorrow against my will and be a different gender or religion or race or any of those things, but I could have a stroke at any time. I could walk out of here and get hit by a bus at any time and become a person with a disability and arguably anyone who lives long enough becomes a person with a disability. <laughs> so I think there's an element to fear of our community. I think to, to a certain degree, we don't think about disability because we don't want to. It makes us uncomfortable because we don't understand it and we could actually become it at some point. So I think that there is a resistance to change, but I don't know that it's partisan motivated. I think it actually goes much deeper than that. I think there's a partisan level, and then there, I think there's something that's we, deeply rooted in our psyche, a way that we've been non-disabled people have been trained to think about disability from birth that makes us really resistant to tackling these issues head on and, quite frankly, partnering with people with disabilities to do it. But I think, though, that uh, voters with disabilities get caught up as the collateral consequences of partisan actions with yeah. voting, so that... Um, because voters with disability or people with disabilities are predominantly poor, predominantly people who are LGBT, predominantly people of color, so that when there's partisan voter suppression, um, then sort of they get swept up. So long lines, for instance, are not designed to um, eliminate voters with disabilities. They're designed to eliminate poor voters and voters of color. Um, but because so many of those folks are voters, with disabilities, then they're going to get suppressed as well. Mm -hmm. Ben? My, my experience, well, we are a state where the party that currently controls the governor's office and the legislature, generally speaking, is the party that does better when more people vote. Uh, so I think that that institutionally sort of weighs against voter suppression in general, mm -hmm. um, just you know, even if you were looking at it just, you know, in the most cynical <laughs> possible way. Um, my experience working with our General Assembly on these issues, and I think it's very consistent, is that th those legislators, and there are some from both parties who have some personal connection um, with, with the issue, who have a family member in particular who has a disability, tend to be the ones who have the expertise, uh, who, who, who are the most outspoken, and other le legislators tend to be somewhat respectful of them in, in terms of deferring to them, and they are of both parties, and uh, it's not those those issues have not tended to break down on partisan lines. At least, again, in my very Delaware-centric experience, I think that um, where it has been hard is the, on on sort of up or down binary choice type issues. That's you know one thing. I think where it's become difficult is that a lot of the issues that that impact um, uh, people with disabilities in Delaware are funding issues, uh, where funding for you, you name it, the whole litany of, of different levels of service that are sometimes required uh, is thrown into the mix with the thousand other things that, that legislators are having to think about funding. And I think that uh, sometimes um, those, those areas and those issues are, are, uh, are losing out and, and are coming up on the short end uh, just in those sort of incremental end of the fiscal year swirl that, uh, that happens when funding decisions are getting made. So I think on the big sort of front and center issues, um, that, uh, that people who are knowledgeable on both parties are being listened to, uh, but I do worry that in terms of our funding, particularly for nonprofits uh, that provide services to, to uh, members of the community with disabilities, that we're every year falling a little further behind and, and it's harder to bring those issues front and center. And I, can, I can say in other countries around the world, reasonable accommodation issues are often confused for partisan issues. Um, so for example, in Tunisia, uh, just this past May, they passed a really awesome law, um, a quota for elected officials with disabilities. So they have a party list system. And the law says if a party doesn't include at least one person with a disability in the top 10 of their party list, they don't get state funding for the election. Um, so 
positive you know law that's happening there however you know and then over 200 officials with disabilities were elected to the municipal level in may so it really actually had an impact as well this is all great but then one of the um elected officials i was speaking to is a wheelchair user and city hall where he needs to go to work is not accessible <laughs> So there's actually funding in the city hall budget to make a ramp and to make the building accessible, but the mayor doesn't want to do it because he's afraid that if he builds the ramp, it'll be seen as favoring the party where the, the person who's a wheelchair user was elected from. So, he's, so there's sort of this confusion between what a reasonable accommodation is and then being seen as partisan and seen as, as working you know, to support one party. And it's, they're sort of stuck at this stalemate right now where the, the mayor is not wanting to build the ramp because he doesn't want to be seen as, he, they think it's only going to help this one MP with a disability rather than thinking about all the voters with disabilities that could then have access to City Hall, all the future people that maybe would run for office and be elected that would then also have access. Um, so as of right now, the ramp's not being built for fear that it will be seen as a partisan, you know, uh, Benny towards that one party. I think the experience of Delaware, to me, is common to other state legislatures and even to our Congress. I think you're 100% right that disability rights champions come from both sides of the aisle. And it's, it's not political ideology, it's that personal experience of disability. I think that's absolutely true, especially in Congress, that disability rights champions, uh, regardless of party, are people who either have a disability or have a family member with a disability. And that personal experience, I th and I think that makes us a fairly nonpartisan. I'm looking at you specifically, Helene, <laughs> because yeah. your organization does the National Disability Voter Registration Week. And I think the letter of support for that, was that Harkin and Dole, Dole. who signed mm -hmm. on to that? Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, that to me is, tells me what I need to know about the, the bipartisan nature of disability rights. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. I mean, I think if we're being honest, I think there is one party that tends to uh, work in our community's favor when you're looking at policy. But we even seen up on Capitol Hill when the ADA was being threatened, um, and it was, it was titled something different than over the years it's been called ADA Notification Act, when you've never been able to get a Democrat to actually support the bill on the House side. It never made it, thank God, to the Senate side, so it died. But we did have Democrats supporting the version of the ADA Notification Act. So, I mean, you can't take anybody for granted, regardless of party. Um, I think you're right. I think for the most part, this is a nonpartisan issue. Um, but even in the work that we've been doing uh, on the ground with our partners, with our RevUp campaign, and we're having candidate forums, uh, we tend not to see both parties always showing up. Um, and it tends to be, um, Democrats who seem to be a little more sympathetic to our issue. But I think if the electorate, um, not the electorate, but the politicians, if they knew that we were voting in greater numbers, you know, it's sort of to me, to some degree, a lot of this is like the chicken or the egg, right? If we were voting in the numbers that we'd like to be voting and had more political clout, I think you would attract the politicians who may not be interested because they won you know, you're not voting and you're not writing a check, because as we said, many in our community cannot afford to support them financially, but we certainly can vote. So, um, like I said, it, I think there is some chicken and, and egg here. And, and again, I go back to why we also have to take some real responsibility as, as individuals with disabilities. Well, we're going to return to that issue a little bit later. Up until now, we've really been focusing on the barriers and the challenges, and I want to shift us into a more forward-looking mode in just a second. But before we do that, a couple of questions, and this is for anyone. Um, what message does it send to people with disabilities when problems with voting, barriers to voting, exist? What message do you think that leaves them with? I know, Rabia, you said previously it gives them the message that I'm not going to try as hard to do this again because I'm going to get the same result. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's humiliating. So, I mean, that um, it is a very sort of strong message that you don't count and then you're not part of the community. I mean, one thing that we haven't talked about is, for instance, I mean, this is really comes to a head when we talk about caucuses. Um, so um, the 
presidential nominating process, caucuses and primaries are getting even more important than they were before. And imagine if you're in Iowa, where everyone in your community is in that junior high school gym, sort of duking it out on whether or not there's going to be sort of this candidate that's going to be president, and you can't come. Um, because it's not accessible, because there's no sign language translator, because you have PTSD, and it's hard to be in an enclosed space that's crowded. Um, and our laws really don't capture um, that type of disability problem, but I think it's incredibly stigmatizing. I mean, that's why I think voting has been targeted as a method to signal uh, first-class citizenship in this country. It's not just about the political efficacy of sort of getting your candidate in office. It's also a strong signal in terms of whether or not you actually matter as someone who is an American citizen. I, yeah. yeah, I agree. I agree. Oh, wow. No, no, I was just going to say, I mean, and again, it's the bigger picture in terms of how people with disabilities, and we talked about, are viewed in this country, right? Uh, when you look at, let's say, for example, you know, autonomous vehicles. Well, are we talking about autonomous, autonomous vehicles being made accessible? No. Are we talking about, you know, protect, um, the protections if you have a pre-existing condition, you know, baby threat? I mean, you can go issue after issue after issue, and I think people with disabilities, um, the worth of people with disabilities are not viewed the same as people without disabilities, and it transcends across the board, including, you know, voting. So, I mean, it's a much bigger issue. I know we're focusing on voting, but, you know, it's a much bigger issue here, and voting is just, you know, a part of it. And I think that Election Day is, is a very unifying day in a lot of respects. We all sort of wrap ourselves in Americana when it comes to voting and elections. Um, I, I, I work in voting, so Election Day is kind of like my Christmas. I get really excited. <laughs> but it's also um, that is the one day when I feel so patriotic. And I just love America on Election Day. And, and there's a lot of data to show that voters all feel that way. Uh, we talk a lot about moving away from a traditional neighborhood polling place model of voting, but there's a lot of data to show that voters love it. They want to go to their neighborhood polling place, even if it means standing in line for a little bit of time. Um, elections officials will tell you that the biggest complaint they ever get is if they don't have I voted stickers. Voters are livid when they don't get the sticker. I'm mad because I had to vote. I already voted because I have to vote absentee because I work all day on election day. And they did my new jurisdiction didn't mail me a sticker with my absentee ballot. I'm not going to have a sticker on election day, and people aren't going to know that I voted. I'm mean, granted if they know me, they know I voted, but they're not going to see my sticker and know that I voted. Like it's a, it's an incredibly American patriotic day. We we do put a lot of emotion around that. And when you are denied participation in that day, what does it say? You're not part of our America. And there's, there's something really deep about that. I think we talk about voting in this way that, oh, if you really want it, you should jump over these barriers to get there. Well, what about these polling places that are saying, well, if there's only like two or three steps, we figured that was good enough. What do I do with that in my wheelchair? <laughs> I'm not, I can't get over those two or three steps. You can't tell me that if I really wanted it bad enough, I would have hurled myself over these three steps and, and risked whatever was going to happen to me uh, to get my ballot cast. It sends a message that um, there are Americans who matter and whose voices are going to be heard, and then there's people with disabilities. Well, and the flip side of my original question is, what message does it send to people who don't have disabilities to not see people with disabilities being part of the process? That people with disabilities aren't equal citizens. You know, and it, it's to me, it's also beyond just casting your ballot. We should have people with disabilities serving as poll workers, serving as observers, running for office, you know, as members of, of political parties and a majority of the countries around the world, including here, that doesn't happen. It's worse than just not being able to cast your ballot. It's also not serving in these political leadership roles. Yeah, I think it um, perpetuates the stigma that we don't work, we don't um, vote, we don't, we live in institutions somewhere. We're doing, mm -hmm. we're doing some work on the census right now, which is a separate issue, although incredibly important if you pay attention to how districts are drawn. We're doing some work on the census and there are these conversations happening about like how people with disabilities are counted and whether or not we should consider them a hard to count population, to which I'm like, of course we should. But then we're hearing from people who work on the census that people with disabilities are being counted because we get head counts from institutions. 
We don't all live in institutions. Like, how can we still be having this conversation that people with disabilities don't live and work in their communities? And I think when we don't see people with disabilities as part of the process and we're not encouraged to include people with disabilities as part of the process and to see them and to think about them, I think it just perpetuates that stigma that we're all being, as Robbie said, warehoused somewhere uh, as we, we used to be once upon a time. And you're making the assumption that people without disabilities are noticing it. Mm -hmm. I would tend to say that's not the case unless, again, you have your own personal connection to, to disability. I don't think somebody goes to the polling place and say, oh, you know, I don't see an accessible machine or, you know, there are mm -hmm. steps. How does somebody in a wheelchair get in here? Guaranteed, they're not thinking that, like I said, unless there's a personal connection. Well, we're more than halfway through our allotted time, and we have spent that time focusing on the myriad challenges. Um, but, but let's turn this around um, and talk about what mechanisms are being used to effectively get people engaged in the process, get them to the polls, um, enable them to actually cast a ballot. Um, Michelle, what are some of the breakthroughs that have made voting more inclusive and accessible? Well, I think that we're talking a lot about, uh, about some really great solutions right now. I love some of the things that are happening in terms of, and there's a caveat to this, but I love anything that opens up the process more and more to voters and just breaks down those barriers. I love online voter registration. I love automatic voter registration, as a matter of fact. Um, if I had my way, there would be no voter registration. I'll just throw that out there. Um, but I love those things that, that, that break down those barriers, though they have to be done responsibly and accessibly, right? If you create an online voter registration portal for the state, and it's not designed to be accessible. I mean, even at the most basic level, if a screen reader can't read it, then it makes voter registration, it opens up that world to everyone except people with disabilities. But I think when it's done well, and it's done in a way that's inclusive, um, I, I, love, I love those kinds of solutions. I like that we're thinking about, um, I think voters increasingly expect options and creating more options. Uh, you can go to your neighborhood polling place on election day, or there should, there's an early voting period. So now I have like two to three weeks, especially if I have to arrange transportation uh, to get me there. So it's not everyone trying to arrange transportation on the same day. Or I can do an absentee ballot. Or if I, that piece of paper is not accessible to me, my absentee ballot can be delivered electronically like they're doing in a handful of states. I, I think the more we have different options for all voters that you can find the method that works for you to be able to cast that ballot. But I think in all of those solutions, the key is baking in accessibility from the start. And when we're pulling, we're pulling stakeholders together to talk about this new thing we want to do when we're going to make a change to how we run elections, people with disabilities when they're at the table are, you know, as Alina said very astutely, people without disabilities aren't noticing when we're not there. And they're not noticing when something's not accessible. So we have to be there. We have to be at those tables uh, being that voice and, and raising those concerns so that from day one, something that's being added to how we run our elections in any particular state or jurisdiction is being implemented in a way that's going to be accessible for everyone and opens up options for all voters. But I'm really excited about a lot of, I love states that innovate and try new things. Um, I, I think the more options we have for voters, it makes it easier to make it work for everyone. We hear from a lot of elections officials that it, they have a lot of trouble making all their polling places fully ADA compliant. Um, I wish they would try harder, but I also hear their concerns a little bit because they're going and looking at locations that they assume would be accessible. I've talked to state election directors who say, we went to nursing homes. We assumed nursing homes would be accessible. And they found nursing homes that were in ADA compliant. You know, How is that a thing? There's so many people there who have accessibility needs. So it, it happens, I get it. You're, your choices are as good as your options. So I think the more that we expand how we think about voting and we expand it out from just the polling place and we expand it out from one day and create more options for voters, we're, we're going to, if done well, make it infinitely more accessible. Yeah, for me, I'm going to look at it wearing my um, disability grassroots lens. Um, so my organization about two and a half years ago started a voting initiative called RevUp, which stands for Register, Educate, Vote, Use Your Power. And it's really all about building the political power of people with disabilities. And um, for somebody who's been doing disability rights work for a long time, I think in general, and I, I think Michelle could attest to this, that our community and even disability advocacy organizations have been somewhat apathetic around the disability vote, a lot of the issues we've been talking about. 
Um, but over the last couple of years, since we've had this initiative, there's been a more, um, I think, more engagement and um, I think the political environment, to be honest, is helping that. But whatever is driving it, it's really, I think, rewarding to see that the disability grassroots and a lot of disability advocacy organizations realize this is important. We've got about 23 disability state voting coalitions happening around the country. And that's not just bringing disability organizations together. You see more mainstream organizations, which I think is just as important that it's not just focused on disability. Mm -hmm. So you see like the League of Women Voters, you see Rock the Vote, you see an organization called Every Library who's gotten very involved in our National Disability Voter Registration Week that we've done for three years. So again, I'm, I'm pleased to see again the, the engagement of our community and the more mainstream disability, uh, voting organizations realizing that the disability vote is important and wanted to help us get that message out and hopefully help us with some of these other barriers that we're, you know, been encountering for, you know, decades now. Well, and Virginia, you, you've seen it all over the world. Uh, and I know that there are some countries that are very far ahead of where we are in this country. What mechanisms and strategies have you seen in other countries that we could adopt? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's some great examples actually from places you might not even expect. Um, the Philippines, for example, allows people with disabilities to register to vote in shopping malls. You know, shopping malls are actually some of the most physically accessible places in most countries, I'd say, including here. Um, and this was a pilot project that they did just for voter registration and just for voters with disabilities, um, which then the general public was like, hey, I want to register to vote at the shopping mall. That's more convenient for me, too. Um, so they've now expanded it as well, and voters with disabilities can actually cast their ballot at the shopping mall. And this is something where you know, you're there already. You might be there with family. It's not going out of the way to some random government building in the middle of nowhere. So it's actually increased the number of voters with disabilities that have registered in the Philippines because it's, it's easier to access it both physically and if you need a family member or a friend or someone to come with you, that's, that's easy. You go to the mall, you have lunch, then you go register to vote. It's not something that's out of the way. Um, some other countries are doing great work around, like Moldova, for example, has put their brochures and guidelines for how to cast your ballot, like where to go, what to do, what the ballot looks like, in easy to read. Um, so voters with intellectual, disabil intellectual disabilities now have this information in a simple, easy to understand format, which I think, quite frankly, most people could also benefit from. That information is often very confusing. Um, Nepal puts their voter registration information in Braille. Um, in Morocco, they discovered that there were not terms in Moroccan sign language for key political participation words. There weren't signs you know, for election, ballot, political party, these kind of Key, key language that's needed to discuss the political process. Um, so we work together with some universities um, and the deaf community to put together a Moroccan sign language lexicon around these political specific terms. Um, we talked about poll worker training. In Guatemala, the poll worker manual there actually includes an entire chapter on disability. So that's where poll workers can go to see the policies on like queue jumping, the policies on assisted voting, you know, how do I use this tactile ballot guide thing that's here. You know, they also taught all poll workers in Guatemala basic sign language. So all poll workers in Guatemala learned how to say hello, goodbye, and thank you in Guatemalan sign. You know, so imagine how much more welcome voters with disabilities feel there in Guatemala. Um, Canada, for example, even before the UN Disability Treaty, eliminated all restrictions on, on voting there. So there's no guardianship restrictions, there's no you know, XYZ type of disability restrictions. Anyone that wants to vote in Canada can vote. Um, and they're also, the election commissions, they're taking this very seriously because they, they still do have barriers, they still have issues. You know, there's buildings that are not accessible. Um, they don't have, they have different rules like we do for federal level elections versus local level elections. So it's not consistent. The experience of a voter is not consistent, but they're doing assessments and they're actually taking steps to rectify that. Um, so there's a lot of positive things happening. Um, in Armenia, for example, I mentioned earlier women with disabilities being multiply marginalized. In Armenia, we have just supported a women with disabilities disabled persons organization to conduct research around the revolution that they've just had over the last six months and see how women with disabilities in particular are participating in that political process. Um, and they've made a series of recommendations to different government stakeholders there. Um, so there's a lot of positive things happening that I think the main lesson learned here in the US of all of these things is that there 
all of these actions are a result of collaborative um, work between government and civil society. You know, it's not just government plowing on, doing whatever they think is best, and it's not just civil society advocating kind of in the darkness. That all of these different initiatives were the result of a positive collaboration between government and civil society. I also want to just co-sign on something Rabia said earlier, because I think it was probably one of the more important things that we've said this morning is that when we talk about voter suppression, people with disabilities aren't typically the target. But because they're such a diverse community, we're still living with the consequences. I mean, we talked about that quickly, but that is so, so profoundly important, I think, in this conversation. And in terms of solutions, I think of that as a challenge to the broader civil rights community and our partner civil and voting rights organizations to be inclusive of people with disabilities in the work that they're doing. They, um, and that's happening more and more. But some of them have uh, so much capacity and some of them do amazing ground efforts throughout in the states, talking to voters, uh, getting them ready for election day, making sure they know their rights, they're catching things, voter suppression things that are happening on the ground really early. You know, voter suppression can be as small as somebody puts up a billboard with the wrong election date on it in a particular community to try to deter people from showing up on the correct day that those kinds of things still happen there are organizations out there that are catching those things and they're not targeting our people but they're affecting our people so the more the broader civil rights community is inclusive of all people and is uh, informed on voters with disabilities and our experiences and prepares their field organizers to interact with people with disabilities because they're going to whether or not they've prepared for it. I think that we can start to um, have a, a larger impact in how we're addressing voter suppression and how it's impacting all voters. Um, so I think that that was, that was something that was really important that came out of the conversation earlier, but in terms of solutions, I think it's really about having a civil rights movement that recognizes disability as a civil rights movement uh, and is increasingly <coughs> inclusive of our people and their efforts. I think also, again, sort of vice versa, right? Like that, um, the disability movement needs to be more inclusive in terms of and, and cognizant of things uh, with respect to race and class and LGBT and all of those things. Because I think one of the big one of the big um, sort of things that will help uh, enhance voting for voters with disabilities is more attention to mass incarceration. Mm -hmm. right? So that um, with deinstitutionalization, that's where people with disabilities ended up. They ended up in prison. Um, so, and it's a sort of a, uh, truism, right, that the biggest mental health facility in the U.S. these days is the L.A. County jail system. So in terms of moving, and we don't have prisoners voting in this country with the exception of two states, Maine and Vermont, both very small, both very white. Um, so, and that's two and a half million people right there. Um, and then there's collateral consequences to that later in terms of people being homeless, not being, and then sort of barriers to registration and having sort of ex-prisoner um, disenfranchisement, which we're moving on in terms of things like re-enfranchising folks that have convictions. All of those things are going to affect voters with disabilities. Um, and then there's also some states, I think, um, that are doing sort of better jobs than others as well in terms of um, collaborating with folks, but um, I think there's there's all the stuff where just generally we don't we don't really emphasize um, the rights of poor people in general. Even the Democrats will not talk about poor people. It's like we'll talk about middle class people, but we won't talk about poor people. Um, and a lot of that is because of. And then we need to think about sort of what does that mean when we talk about voters with disabilities? Because people with disabilities are so poor. So when we even think about something like getting the youth vote, does youth vote means people in colleges? Right? Or does it mean people who are young? It's very different. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, the other way beyond, oh, sorry, no, no, this goes way beyond voting, but just right. very quickly, I also think, um, and this is part, wrapped up in what you were saying, disability rights in general need significantly more diverse leadership. Yes. Oh, our <laughs> leadership is so uh, just older and white. white. <laughs> we just, we need more young people and we need more uh, people who aren't white and we need more people who are LGBTQ and we just need so, so much more diverse leadership and I think it would have us thinking in new directions um, and, and trying some new things. Yeah.
Uh, to that point, I, I wanted to bring something else up, but I think if you look at the young leaders in our movement who are really thinking about these issues, um, and, you know, hopefully over the next 10 years or so, we'll start to see a change because I know all the, the youth that we deal with, like in our organization, I mean, that is the biggest focus in terms of, you know, how do we change sort of the, the color <laughs> of our community and the color of leadership. So um, I'm optimistic, I guess, because of, I, I do think um, the young folks in our movement are really thinking about things that us older white folks really haven't thought enough about. The, the other thing I wanted to mention that's encouraging, and Virginia talked about more people with disabilities actually running for office. Mm -hmm. So the National Council on Independent Living, which is a national advocacy organization, has been keeping a list this year. And there's about 70 people with disabilities that were running for office. I think out of the 70, when you look at some who lost their primary race, we're talking about 53 candidates. So we haven't been tracking this, but I'm going to assume you know, that's probably a very large number for our community. And that will make a difference. That means hopefully, you know, polling places will be more accessible as we get more candidates. Campaigns, we haven't talked about campaigns aren't accessible, right? Their websites many times aren't mm -hmm. accessible. They're not thinking about those things. So we need to encourage more people with disabilities, you know, running for office and getting elected to office. And we're seeing that again in this election cycle. cycle. Um, I hope it's not a one-time deal. I know we're also seeing just in general like more women, more people of color, but that's something I think we really have to keep uh, working on in our community. Before we move on to some new topics, there, there's been some buzz about alternatives to traditional voting, like phone voting and um, online voting and mobile voting, where you actually take the ballot to individuals who can't make it to a traditional polling place. Any thoughts on those strategies? Okay, one thing that's difficult is um, in terms of security. So on the one hand, we want to make voting more accessible to people. But then on the other hand, we are worried about hacking. We are worried about security. We are worried about having any type of backup mechanism so that um, we don't want to just go back to paper, because paper is inaccessible in a lot of different, for a lot of different people. Um, but we have to make sure that if we are going to things like phone voting, then um, we, we have an accurate vote tally um, and that people who are using those types of mechanisms feel confident that their vote is going to be accurately tallied as well because people aren't necessarily confident um, about that. So with mobile voting though, I think that um, that they're the switching the emphasis so that we bring the election to people is something that's really important. So that we send election officials to, say, long-term care facilities, that we don't require people to go to the election instead. I think that that is, that is something that then sort of brings in more in terms of uh, thinking about voting as an affirmative sense that the government has a duty to fulfill, as opposed to voters having to jump through a whole bunch of hoops in order to be able to vote. Yeah, I would say in quite a few other countries, they do have um, a mobile ballot box mm -hmm. that will take the ballot to your home or, or wherever mm -hmm. so that you can cast your ballot. The problem is that that's now being used as an excuse by election commissions to not make polling stations yep. accessible. Yep. Because yep. they're like, well, we have this mobile ballot box, mm -hmm. we can just take it to your home. Where many yeah. voters don't want to do that. They right. would prefer to vote you know, with their family, with their friends and their communities at the polling station. Um, so it's kind of a double-edged sword. Yep. Many voters do want the mobile ballot box and do mm -hmm. really need it. That's the only way that they would be able to vote. But in many countries where, where I'm working, that's it's a huge problem to the point where some disability activists in countries that do have a mobile ballot box are advocating for the government to get rid of it. Right. Like it's that bad that the government, they, they are literally advocating to get rid of the mobile ballot box because the government's now not making any changes to polling stations to make them accessible. Um, so that happens here I too. I mean, yeah. yeah. Yeah, right? just like yeah. it's yeah. the. Like, yeah. You know, what do you have to go to the right. poll? Right. Places that Even have with caucuses, voting. yeah. Places yeah. that have curbside yeah. voting, voting, where if yeah. you, yeah. you can get to you can get to the polling place, but you can't get in, they have to bring the ballot out. And I think people they think if you pass a state law 
for curbside voting now we're covered legally, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. it doesn't yeah. matter if the polling place isn't accessible. But those kinds of things can be a nightmare in practice on election day because the poll workers don't want to do it. Right. Um, especially if it slows or stops the lines because you got to send out a couple poll workers with a ballot out to the curb. So we have these like loopholes in the law. Like you got to make your polling places accessible, but if you can't, like have have alternate methods. You can have curbside and absentee, right. and then we don't solve all the problems. So I think right. that happens here as well. And I think that. Um, People say things like that to me all the time, like, oh, how are we going to fix these problems? Well, oh, they can just all vote absentee, right? Mm -hmm. You mean an entire class of people can just vote absentee? Yeah. Wait, that's that. You're, what you're describing is segregation. Why would we? We would never say that all the men will go to the polls, and if women want to vote that bad, they can request an absentee ballot. We wouldn't say that about anybody else. We shouldn't say that about people with disabilities. Um, but I think that. I do think that some type of mobile or internet voting could be very powerful uh, and could, would absolutely change the landscape of our elections. I agree, I just think, don't think we're there quite yet. It's really being developed and piloted right now. So I think for voters, for the average voter, they're like, why can't I vote on my mobile phone? I do everything else on my mobile phone. I do too. I mean, I could set the alarm on my home in Northern Virginia right now um, or change the lights or quite frankly see a camera in my living room. I never thought I would be living in this kind of world, right? Yeah. I can do everything from my phone. But so could Ex Russia, though. That's right? the problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we moved through with the internet. I mean, we haven't had the internet that long. Right. The internet hasn't really been around that long. I remember when it started. So. Yeah. Um, we, we moved very fast with pushing everything to, to internet. We do all our banking that way now. I mean, I don't want my vote stolen, but I definitely don't want my money stolen. Um, and so we moved very quickly into the realm of the internet, and now we're sort of backtracking and thinking about how much of it we did not secure when we started doing that. So I, I think, I still think it's probably the future. I think it's something that voters want. I can't imagine that we're not going to move in that direction. I think the question is, when are we really going to be ready for that? How quickly is that coming? Or how much work is it going to take to secure it? And I don't think that, I don't sense a lot of agreement on that issue yet. I think even um, there are some amazing election security advocates out there that are doing great work, but I don't know that they even all agree with each other about what the solutions are and when they're coming. So I think that still goes back to Congress putting that research and development money out there. Uh, if we want better solutions, I think we have to start funding them. Estonia has all online voting, um, the whole country, but there's also a high level of trust in the internet in Estonia. The country has free Wi-Fi everywhere. You know, it's right. a smaller country, um, but even that's been abused. You know, there's a case where um, a care home, the director took the voter registration numbers of everyone that lived there and he voted for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, however, they have really good anti-fraud measures there. They caught that. You know, so this this idea that you shouldn't allow you know people with disabilities to vote that live in care homes or people with disabilities right. to vote um, online is just disenfranchisement is not the answer. The answer is better anti-fraud measures. Yeah. You know, so yeah, that did happen, but it was caught, um, and that's something I think that we could eventually be moving towards. But I agree, I don't think the security experts at this point in time think we're anywhere near being able to do that soon. Well, one last question on this access issue, and then we're going to move on to some others. But there are obviously lots of things that can be done. What will it take, and particularly Matt and Rabia, to compel state governments to move in a more inclusive direction? A big crisis. A crisis. <laughs> yeah, I mean, election law was transformed by Bush v. Gore where people before were banging their heads against the walls um, when they were saying how broken um, the election system is into the, in the United States. And then we had, remember the guy with the eyeball, like sort of looking at the, the butterfly ballot. And then it really brought home to people that, um, that there was something that was flawed. So, I mean, I think crises matter in some ways to help propel things, unfortunately, in the United States. Maybe if there was a crisis that happened to the Republican Party voters, then that would be in some ways ideal in terms of perhaps sort of propelling um, something that may happen in terms of regulatory change. But it's hard to, I guess, push people out of I mean, at best, a general sense of unease into sort of a real worry that is going to be backed by dollars um, that something is going to happen. Matt, Not that I wish for that to happen. So, Do you think yeah. it's going to take a crisis, or are there other things that can be done? Well, at the, uh, at the state level, uh, and I, I mentioned this a little earlier, I don't think there's any aversion and maybe the opposite to expanding 
uh, the ability for people to, to register and to vote. I think that the what, what holds things back at the state level is the concern that was mentioned earlier about security, uh, about uh, things breaking down on election day, about interference with the process. So <clears throat> even incremental steps that have been taken over the last 10 or 15 years, very few states want to be the first state to, we are the first state, we like being the first state, but um, <laughs> it's there, I think there's some reluctance to being the first state to do something that is technologically new as far as the voting process goes uh, because there have been enough other mishaps seen that no one wants to be the state that had their, their system go down or, or, or get uh, compromised somehow. So I think that's the main, at the state level, at least in this state, I think that's really the, the main barrier is, is, is just you know having confidence that whatever new step is taken, whether it's a phone or, or what have you, that there's going to be the level of, of security that's, that's needed for the, the process to have integrity. I want to see more advocacy directly from voters. We do a lot of work with voter protection. Like if people know the election protection hotline, 866-OUR-VOTE, that you can call like if you're being den denied your right to vote on election day. And we don't get enough calls from voters with disabilities. It's really hard to capture what's happening to people with disabilities when they go to vote if they don't tell us. And I, because I'm very involved in that, I mean, I'm literally at the headquarters on election day, that's why I have to vote absentee, taking calls. Like if you call in, you might talk to me. Uh, if, I, if I say my name and you remember me, say, hey, Michelle, I met you in Delaware. Um, but it's, we, we, get, we don't get enough calls from voters with disabilities. And when I talk to voters with disabilities and I hear about their experiences, our standards are way too low. <laughs> we, we go to the polling place and we come up against all types of things that are illegal and not accessible. And so long as we got to cast that ballot, we just move on with our day and we don't report it. Or I've talked to voters who, <laughs> the polling place was totally inaccessible, but the poll workers were really nice about it and they tried really hard and they really wanted to help me. Oh, well, that's nice. Okay, so write a letter to the county clerk that the, your poll worker is really nice, but you still have to tell me if your polling place is not accessible so we can do something about it. And I think the voters with disabilities are, we're willing to accept far too low a standard and we're not advocating for ourselves. I want to see voters with disabilities, we call that election protection hotline. When something goes wrong on election day or even if you just see something that's inaccessible, even if you get to cast your ballot, if it shouldn't have happened and you see it, you should be reporting it. We have to start being able to build a bank of those experiences that we can reference when we say this isn't working for people with disabilities. We need that information. And I, I can even think of I, 2016 uh, getting a call where there was a polling place and it had a separate accessible entrance. It was already not my favorite thing, but it happened. But the poll workers didn't know about the accessible entrance, so they never set up the signage to tell someone where it was. So a guy shows up who uses a wheelchair, and the solution the poll workers came up with was to lift him in his wheelchair and carry him up like a grassy slope to get him into the polling place, which is incredibly dangerous. And we got a call about it, but the, the voter who uses the wheelchair didn't call us. A random non-disabled person in line who saw it and thought, that doesn't look right, called us. Um, <laughs> why aren't people with disabilities reporting these things? Why, for the person with a disability, was it good enough that the poll workers were willing to lift me up a grassy hillside and I got to cast my ballot? That was good enough for that voter. It because took a non-disabled person all of this. saying this right. isn't good enough and making yeah. that call. So I think we have to be doing some of our own advocacy, or at least, we, I, I need you to start doing some of your own advocacy. Let, let us know what's happening because we want to we want to help fight for that and get it fixed, but we have to know what's happening first. I think the, that for the non-disabled voter, that's one thing that sort of stuck out, but for the wheelchair user, like they deal with uh, being sort of humiliated on a nonstop and daily basis. So I think that that's sort of one thing that's hard in terms of that then, um, sort of reduces people complaining about stuff because it's everyday experience. I mean, I say like, I mean, as sort of a black woman, if I had to call a hotline for all of the things that happened to me, right, I would not, I would be on the phone all day. <laughs> it's exhausting. So I don't know if it's necessarily like we need to put sort of the onus on the person that's being sort of treated like crap. It's absolutely not right to put the onus on, on the person that. who is being oppressed. Absolutely, I agree 100%. Right. Um, but 
So I think so. Sometimes what, that is what makes change. So is when the people who are being oppressed get angry and don't take it anymore. I don't know though, because I mean, for instance, like the General Accounting Office has been doing sort of the survey data on the lack of accessibility in polling places, basically every ma major election, and we know that it's bad, and that's not doing anything, right? So I don't know if sort of having a whole bunch of people call the 1-800 number is going to do much of anything either. So one thing perhaps that may help is that, so for instance with um, real estate racial discrimination, it's supposed to happen with disability discrimination, but definitely doesn't, ha doesn't happen as much, is to you basically do sting operations, right? That you have people go um, to um, see whether or not white people who want to sort of rent a house are treated the same as black people who want to, want to rent a house. And if the real estate agent says to the black people, oh, it's rented already, then there's going to be hell to pay under the Fair Housing Act. So that's something that could happen, right? If we did, we could do sting operations with polling places, right? So then it wouldn't necessarily then be the onus on the person, the voter with a disability that just tried to vote, right? And then move on with their life. And instead that then it becomes something where it's like perhaps shame and fine. Um, but that's going to have to take then, again, a Department of Justice or a state to do something like that. I think there are a lot of great solutions that don't put the onus on the voter if we ever had the capacity to do those things. Mm -hmm. and, and we don't. Um, and, and they don't have to call me. Don't call an 800 number if that won't work. <laughs> but you know, call your county clerk who runs elections and tell them how bad your polling place was. Because right. your county clerk may not know. They, they might not know. They should, but they might not know. Call your state legislator and tell them what kind of legislation you want to see to correct those problems. I mean, no, we shouldn't put the onus on the oppressed, but that, that is part of, I mean, you know, participation in civics and, and asking for the changes that you want to see is part of the design of our democracy, too. So to an extent, that, that might be necessary. I mean, I think that the organizations that do this kind of advocacy work and, and even the uh, government officials who are involved don't necessarily have the capacity to do, although I like that idea, I want to be involved in the sting operation, <laughs> but I don't know that we, we have the capacity to make it happen. But, but Michelle, in reality, how many people with disabilities even know that number, in reality? Right. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. They don't. I right. mean, your organization may be sending it out, we're sending it out, but there's so many people with disabilities that are not connected mm -hmm. to an advocacy group anywhere, and even if they wanted to call it, I don't even think they'd know, you know where to start. So that's part of it, too. I, I right. agree. I wonder I if there's something switch. that could be happening with allyship, then. So if, if it is that sort of people with disabilities are connected to people without disabilities, maybe they could do some of this work. But it doesn't seem as if sort of they're pushing for this this stuff either. And certainly with respect to people with mental disabilities, sometimes one of the biggest barriers towards enfranchising people with mental disabilities are the caretakers and loved ones that are around them um, in terms of not facilitating that or actively blocking it. I do want to switch gears because there are a couple of areas I still want to explore and we are getting close on time. So. I think another thing that disengages or causes people to become disengaged is that candidates aren't talking about their issues. They're not acknowledging what's important to them. They don't become a part of the candidate's platform. Um, and so people sort of walk away and say, why should I go to the trouble if my voice doesn't matter and if people aren't even listening to the things that matter to me? Um, and, and there's, I mean, historically, we, we've seen that over and over again. Um, in the last presidential cycle, several of the candidates didn't even address disability issues on their websites where they, they laid it out for everyone. Um, this is a question I'm directing to you, Matt. Um, you have taken on important issues um, to the disability community, um, but why doesn't that happen as frequently with your peers, either elected officials or people who are hoping to become elected officials? Well, the questions have to get asked. I mean, I've run four times for a statewide <laughs> office, uh, and I think one of those four times uh, was there any kind of forum that were, th there was any sort of specific subject matter that related to issues affecting people with disabilities. And I think, and I don't think that at any other forum that I've ever been in over the course of 14 years that I was ever asked a question uh, 
um, that was specific to that. So um, the question has to get it, and that's and that's that is not the case with a lot of other issues that are important to people in the state. I'm not running this time, so I've had the opportunity to kind of step back a little mm -hmm. bit and, and see other people go through the process. And our candidates who just went through the primaries ran sort of a gauntlet of of lots of different debates that were put on by lots of different groups that had very specific subjects that they were interested in, where they were asked lots and lots of questions uh, that were very targeted and precise and specific and forced to kind of think through the issues and put themselves on the record and make commitments about issues. And that's part of how you get uh, candidates to be where you want them to be when they actually are in a position to, uh, to vote. Um, so I think that related to that, well, to get that, I think that you have to have organizations, and again, everything I know is Delaware specific, but I think that there have to be organizations in Delaware that are sort of mature and sophisticated enough in, in pursuing something like that that they can actually do it well. And the people who get results in Legislative Hall are organizations that can mobilize lots and lots of people in every single one of the state house and state senate districts to to write a handwritten letter or make a telephone call. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the downside of everybody being so interconnected is that everybody thinks that they're impacting their legislator because they push a button mm -hmm. and it sends an automated email to a legislator and they get 90 emails that say exactly the same thing. And, and what really impacts them is getting some kind of, you know, personal contact, whether it's a, a phone call. Here in Delaware, legislators get calls at their house uh, or, you know, or a handwritten letter. So we don't yet, there's not a lot of groups in Delaware that have that capability, um, but I, I do think that that's really what you need in order to, to really move the ball forward, both in terms of candidates and then also once the election's over and you're dealing with the, the nuts and bolts of some of the issues that I mentioned earlier about just the, sort of the, you know, the necessary funding for, for some of these, mm -hmm. uh, these support efforts. It's, it's um, the organization has to be there, the questions have to get asked, and there have to be real consequences in terms of how legislators ultimately vote on these issues. Yeah. Well, I Helena, also, yeah. I, I know that Rev Up is very much engaged in this issue. Yeah, and I completely agree with the Attorney General. I mean, what we've been pushing for throughout the country with our partners is go to town halls, ask the questions, hold candidate forums, send out question, quest, candidate questionnaires. And it's happening in some states. So I know in Ohio, they held a candidate forum. They had close to 400 people attend. Uh, they streamed it. Texas had a, another really successful candidate forum. But I think you're right. It's We have to start politically engaging and again, you know, going to the town halls, asking the questions, going to the district office, you know, going to Capitol Hill, um, and get politicians to take, you know, notice that we are, you know, an electorate and that we'll vote for you depending on how you vote on our issues. We also have to think, educate people with disabilities. We can't just assume because you have a disability you understand the issues. So, you know, one of the things we did with our campaign is we put out an issues guide and we, mm -hmm. It's pretty comprehensive, but we tried not to get too wonky. We tried to keep it sort of simple, but you know, if it, Medicaid, right? You know, is being threatened. Um, ADA is being threatened. You know, do you care about affordable, accessible housing, accessible transportation? You know, getting rid of some minimum wage. I mean, we could go on and on, but I think our community also really needs to be educated about the issues, and we can't just assume because you have a disability you understand those issues. Um, so it's, it's, it's complicated, it's multi-layered, and um, you know, I think it's incumbent upon all of us who um, are working you know, with a disability organization or are a disability organization to really reach out to our grassroots. And I think you're right, we have to organize, and we have to mobilize. And, if, and we saw that we can be successful doing that. Um, you know, in the summer of 2017, when the grassroots came out to save Medicaid, when it came to you know repeal and replace of the Affordable Care Act, we were instrumental. We were instrumental, and I can't tell you how many times we've gone up to Capitol Hill, where members will say, "Hey, you know, congratulations to the disability community. You know, you helped save Medicaid." They notice that we need to do more of that. And just lastly, our community is actually. I guess you can argue either way, but we're taking responsibility for Connor Lamb, for some of you may know, he ran 
a close election in Pennsylvania. He won. He was in a district that Trump won by 20%. He engaged the community. He went to visit an independent living center. He came out in support of the Disability Integration Act. And folks with disabilities came out and voted for him. I think when we talk about elections, we've also asked people with disabilities to engage in a very limited way. I think we talk about the fact that people with disabilities need to vote, and then I think we only expand that out to, oh, they should also sign up to be poll workers, which is a really cool idea, that'd be great, uh, but it's also a really long day and very physically taxing for people with certain types of disabilities, at least that's the feedback that I get from a lot of people. But what about, I mean, as a private citizen, you can be as partisan as you like. What about volunteering for a campaign? for a candidate you're really passionate about. What about volunteering with your local party? What about, I, I do like when we do disability specific forums, but what I want to see is more people with disabilities at every other forum in the state asking disability questions. So no matter where candidates go, they see people with disabilities and they're asked those disability the town questions hall. that they're not being asked at all those forums and town halls. Um, I, what about, I actually have a good friend with cerebral palsy who has changed the lives of some of her state representatives and senators by just inviting them to come to her home and have coffee. And some of them take her up on it. She invites some neighbors and they, they educate let sitting legislators about disability issues. People who don't have that personal connection, who don't understand. So I think there's a million different ways to get involved in the political machine. And you can find something that suits you. Uh, you can find something that works for you if being a poll worker for umpteen hours in one particular day is not something that's going to work for you. And I think that we haven't been making that ask of our community to be more visible and more politically involved. Well, and I want to uh, follow along on something that Helena said about helping the community of people with disabilities and those who care about them uh, to be more familiar with the issues. Uh, Virginia, I read something in, in one of your publications that talked about the community actually developing its own manifesto to present to people campaigning for office. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so one of the, the biggest issues that we find working in other countries around the world is that um, people with disabilities, similar to here, are not you know, a voting block, are not mobilized, um, are politically engaged, and are in many cases actually not even interested in being politically engaged. You know, Disabled persons organizations are focusing on inclusive education or accessible transportation, um, you know, like thematic areas that they see as more important than political participation. So a big part of my job and what I do is go in and try and help them see how, okay, inclusive education is your top priority. Well, the government's not gonna listen to you unless they see you as a voting block. You know, so you need to work on political participation and that then has a ripple effect on everything else. Um, so this is a big part of the work that we do. And something that we found also is that for people with disabilities in many countries where we work that are actually advocating with elected officials, they often are not unified in, in actually sometimes asking for conflicting things, um, asking for, for things that are just not remotely possible. Um, so government is using that as an excuse to then just do nothing. Um, so something that we've started doing in more and more countries is working with uh, disability rights activists to develop a policy platform. And this is, you know, of course no one's gonna agree on everything, but this is like a list of like the top five to 10 priorities that the disability community in, in that country can agree on. And then we do advocacy trainings with them so that they can go forward and use those skills in advocating for the things in the policy platform to be adapted. And we've had tangible successes. Um, we started doing this about seven years ago. Um, and so like in 2012 in the Dominican Republic presidential elections, we developed a policy platform there. Um, the government had had a national disability rights law that had been languishing for years um, in the legislature, just not being passed. And that law was finally passed. That was one of the recommendations um, in the policy platform. They, the government that was elected also had started installing curb cuts in the capital in Santo Domingo. Their national literacy plan, for the, they actually made it inclusive of young people with disabilities. And all of these things were specific asks that were in the policy platform. And so we're in this context, it's a little bit different than here in the US, but IFAS can come in as an international organization and we can request that all of the different candidates come to a forum where people with disabilities can present their policy platform and actually have the candidates physically sign it and say like, yes, if I'm elected, I'll, I'll work towards implementing these different areas. Um, so we're able to have sort of a different dynamic there, I guess, where we can use our cloud as an international organization to get those candidates to come. But then it's up to the local disability advocates after the election to use that leverage to say, hey, you know, go to the Minister of Education and say, hey, your, your presidential candidate signed this and he said that he would make this literacy plan inclusive. What are you gonna do? 
Um, and this is something that we've done in many countries around the world. And most recently, uh, just again in Armenia last year, which was turned around um, by the government and used in a really interesting way where the government, a week after the disability community had their policy platform activity with the political parties, the lead um, government party had their own policy platform that they developed on disability rights. And it wasn't totally accurate, you know, it was, it was saying things, you know, look, we're the best, we did all these different things, which not so much really happened. Um, but then kind of peer pressured the disability advocates into signing onto it and saying like, yes, we will vote for you, for your party and for all of your candidates, um, which is terrible. <laughs> you know, it's awful that that happened. But, um, you know, as I was saying last night, I actually was quite excited that it happened because it shows that the disability community is now kind of worth bribing. You know, it's worth the time of the politicians to, to engage in sort of these, these nefarious actions that they're doing with the broader public as well. Um, so there, in this context now, people with disabilities are being actively courted by government and by elected officials or people that want to be elected. And that, I think, can only be a positive thing in the end. Thank you. I can't believe two hours has passed. I would love to stay and continue to explore these issues with you. I thank you so very much for helping us here in this room, those connected with us from other places, not just here in Delaware, but around the country, um, to help us understand the issues, the possible solutions, and really drive home the point that the, it's a multi-layered problem with a multi-layered solution, but we all have a part to play if we want to see that world be the world that we're living in. Um, so thank you all for coming, and please join me in thanking our panelists, Rabia Bell, Virginia Atkinson, Michelle Bishop, Kalina Berger, and Matt Dunn.